Welcome back to another UNC football recruiting podcast here on TarHillIllustrated.com. And if you're checking us out on our YouTube channel, Tar Heel Illustrated, I'm THI publisher Andrew Jones. And joining me is our director of football recruiting, Miss Dina King. And Dina, 2021 football recruiting, there's not a whole lot left for North Carolina, but it's not over yet. 16 commits in the books. Mac recently said that they're going to take 20 weed projected 21 for a while they're going to go 20 right now is what he said so that means there's four more spots to fill but we're kind of in sort of a lull in recruiting right now I would even say that there's almost been a pause button pushed on recruiting not a lot of information going on not a lot of stuff going on around the nation not many kids have committed the last few weeks with fall camp starting and all the craziness surrounding college football in general not a lot of top 10 lists being released or anything like that. So it's kind of given us a chance to sort of catch our breath because June and July were crazy and sort of look at the landscape and, and take a look at what UNC has in the, in the books with the 16 commitments and then what's left, what, what, what kids are going to pursue to fill those final four spots. So I'm going to ask you right now, class of 2021, we believe four spots left. How do you kind of look at what UNC has left to finish up this class? Well, when Jared Wilson decommitted and uh, recommitted to Georgia, it, it opened up an offensive line spot for UNC. And two of the kids that I'll talk to today on this podcast are, were have always been a target uh, for, for Carolina, Yusuf Mor Morgerville and a big offensive lineman from Murphy up in the Western North Carolina. <clears throat> he he has uh, been one of uh, Carolina's top targets that they have uh, kind of increased the uh, recruiting on him since Wilson's decommitment. And then they offered a uh, kid, Diego Pounds, a big, offensive lineman from Millbrook out of Raleigh that offered him a few weeks ago and he was basically getting ready to uh, uh, make possibly make a, a decision and then the offer from UNC came and made him kind of step back and re-evaluate his uh, recruiting. Uh, uh, Diego was at several at uh, the UNC uh, uh, been on campus a lot. I remember him uh, being at, you know, our photograph gallery at some of the basketball games. So th those two guys, I mean, uh, I think Carolina's pushing for the, for one of those guys to be a, a, a commitment. Uh, well, let's stay up before you go to the other ones. Let's stay on the offensive line because they, they, they want to bring another offensive lineman. They're, I don't think they're going to bring in both. I don't think they're going to bring in two. Uh, they do have four more spots to fill, and I'm not entirely sold that they're going to sign you – know, they're going to get commitments from four more high school kids. They might leave a spot open for down the road because I think the dynamics have changed a little bit in the last three weeks as well with the Big Ten not playing, uh, the Pac-12 not playing. We don't know what's going to happen. If the ACC will even go through and play, we don't – the high school football has been postponed and canceled a lot of places. I think a lot of stuff has changed so much in the last couple of weeks that they may not take four more high school kids. And if they don't, we certainly don't think they're going to take two more offensive linemen, probably going to take one more offensive, uh, one more offensive lineman. And they've been on Yusuf a lot longer than they have Diego Pounds. But which you, like you said, the offer to Pounds may not have been a game changer. That may not be a fair characterization but it certainly changed a lot of things. Like you said, he put it on hold. Now, what would it take for them to get someone like him? And do you think that he is one or two on their priority list there for those two? Well, Diego, he, he plays basketball too. So he was in uh, Rock Hill, I believe, with uh, Keyshawn Silver's a basketball player. This uh, summer basketball leagues that they're – having in <clears throat> phenom hoops, uh, they kind of bonded a lot. And so uh, I, I believe Diego knows a lot since he's in, he is in Raleigh, so he knows a lot of these kids. And like I said, he, he, he came on campus with several of them when uh, 
when they they could be on campus so he he knows a lot of these kids so i mean if i was a uh, I, I don't bet, but I think the odds are better for, for Pounds becoming a Tar Heel than uh, Yusuf because uh, just basically kind of where Yusuf is located, he's he's closer to a lot of the SEC schools uh, rather than Chapel Hill. And so he, uh, um, you know, the, the, the travel and everything. So I, I, if I was betting, I, I would think odds are better to – to land pounds than a uh, Mulgerville. I like pounds because I like I love I love linemen that play another sport. You know, you know what they're 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 working with Kevin Hester, who was originally a basketball player. But especially if you have an offensive lineman like Caden Baker was a pretty good high school basketball player down in Florida. If you have an offensive lineman that's a basketball player. Footwork is such a huge part of playing on the offensive line, especially the way blocking schemes are now as opposed to 25 years ago. And if a kid can play high school basketball, Millbrook's got a good basketball team. They're usually one of the better programs, uh, better teams in, in the, the Triangle area. Uh, obviously, he's an athlete. He can move his feet. He's the kind of kid that, as big as he is, you bring him in, you, you coach him up, and who knows, maybe he's the next Marcus McKeithen type kid. I, I kind of like his upside. And you and I talked before, by the way, uh, full disclosure here, we wondered why there wasn't an offer. We had a couple of conversations on the phone, like, when's Carolina going to offer Diego Pounds? Why haven't they offered? And we would get text messages or emails and DMs from people asking, why haven't they offered Diego Pounds? So when they finally did, that you know, not a lot of offers of linemen generate much buzz, but that offer did generate some buzz. Yeah, he he uh, kind of – he was a sleeper top uh, recruit, and then he started getting some of the heavy hitters offers and uh like you said i was like well wonder why why carolina has it offered and then you know it, it may be just simply the fact that carolina's it was selective and uh they got their top targets at that time and spots filled up but they uh you know they lost wilson back to georgia so it opened it up another spot so uh Who's to say Pounds wasn't in their top five uh, lineman targets, and uh, that they've rekindled the showing love to to uh, Pounds? Um, they do have a big target still on the other side of the ball. Someone that um, I think a lot of people have been trying to figure out kind of where things stand. So f- fill us in there on uh, Mr. Ingram Dawkins from South Carolina. Yeah, Tyron. He's out of Gaffney, a defensive lineman that um, we followed a lot. He's ver- he's on the social media a lot with with the the Carolina commits, and he he intermingles with with a lot of them, especially uh, Ra Ra and Keyshawn and the other defensive prospects. And uh, as of this podcast, South Carolina is going to be playing football. As 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 well, uh, you know, JJ Jones sent us a tweet last night uh, of their schedule. schedule. So, yeah, so, they got uh, their schedule in place, even even the so, exhibition games. Yeah, so uh, he's he, you know, he he is a major target. He he's going to be uh, if he comes to UNC, uh, he he will uh, add more to a, a great defensive line class and and position group that Carolina is already building up with uh, the the guys that they've already got in this 21 class and the the, the guys they got in the earlier class so uh, you know he still hasn't been at UNC and I, I kind of think that is helping UNC because he's not committed to any other place maybe he is waiting for that chance to get on campus to UNC to see what Mac and uh, the rest of the coaching staff, what Carolina can offer to him as uh, for playing and the Carolina experience. So I kind of see that, you know, he hasn't, he hasn't committed anywhere else. So maybe he's just buying his time to, to, to possibly get that visit to Chapel Hill soon. And there's been a laser focus on them wanting him. We know that a lot of the kids that are committed have made him a priority. You know, you're going to have something coming up here in the next couple of weeks about some of the commitments 
that are recruiters that are, you know, Keyshawn and Ra Ra, some of those guys are phenomenal recruiters and they've been uh, uber focused on, on trying to get him to, to feel the love of Carolina blue, I guess. And also he hadn't been on campus yet, but nobody can take official visits, but there's nothing in, in the NCAA legislation that says a kid and his parents can't hop in a car and drive to a campus and drive around, check things out. So he's only three hours away. So if he really wants to see North Carolina at some point, it, it, it will be a Saturday or a Sunday trip or whatever, hop in the car in the morning, check it out for a few hours, cruise Franklin street and then drive back home. And he's got much more feel for UNC. Bryson Nesbitt is somebody that you've talked to a couple times here in the last two months. You saw him in the seven on seven where uh, you really, really fell in love with this game. And if you watch this video, I mean, it's really easy to, to appreciate his immense skills, uh, he, but he, he's probably going to, Hey, last time we talked to you, I guess he said he's going to string this thing out a little bit more because he wants to go take some visits. He wants to go out and visit Southern Cal and some other places. But right now, nobody can go anywhere. And if they're not going to play in the Pac-12 until January in anything, that means no one's going to be able to visit until January. Well, signing day is in December. So how much do you think the Pac-12 situation and nobody, you know, nobody able to go out to the California schools helps UNC with someone like Bryson Nesbitt? Well, he first of all, Bryson has taken his recruitment. You know, he he is he he's not in no rush to to make a decision. I, I've learned that from him by by talking to him. He's uh, taking um, him with his dad being a former uh, football player for South Carolina and uh, at at uh, with the Carolina Panthers. You know, he's taking this process very serious and looking at all his options and the last time we spoke to him he had he had did a top 12 but I think he's kind of uh, working on making a shorter list and I I feel very uh, confident that UNC is going to be in the, that that final list as, as well as South Carolina you know he likes South Carolina a lot and you know with his dad being a former South Carolina player you know, you could you could see that, but uh, the the school that kind of intrigues me uh, when talking to Bryson, he he wants to go out to UCLA, and like you said, uh, the the Pac-12 in their situation about the football, I mean, he you know you can't go out there and visit, so that may help the uh, the schools closer to him. It, it, I think uh, UNC is in great shape. Uh, uh, you know, we've talked to Garrett Walston. And he he's already just gleaming over uh, Coach Lilly and he and you know Coach Lilly's pedigree and I think Coach Lilly has made um, a lot of inroads with Bryson because you know there was a time when Coach Brewster left and there was a void there at the tight end coaching position recruiting wise and and maybe UNC kind of kind of felt back a little because they really didn't have a coach but when they brought coach Lilly in that that he he was probably one of uh coach Lilly's first priority uh in state guy in the Charlotte area so I, I think Bryson has is really high on UNC and Carolina has a great shot to land him. I think one of the things that impressed me that Bryson uh told you uh, five six weeks ago was how a lot of his communication with Coach Lilly was Coach Lilly looking at his film and teaching him through his film already. So he's already coaching him up in a sense, and he's not even committed. And and you could tell that Bryson, you know, not only appreciated that, but there was sort of a coach-player relationship already in process. And you get an opportunity to do that in recruiting, and and a kid isn't too far away, and and he already likes everything about your school. That's 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 how you hook them and reel them in. And I agree with you. I think Carolina's in pretty good shape there. Now, we're not going to discuss the other players because there are some kids that are out there, either whose names we don't know. We should be totally honest with you about that. We don't know yet who could be on the radar. I think what happens what happens around the country and around college football and even high school football might result in some more names popping up on the radar here. And there's also the possibility that 
kids can transfer. They may they may keep a spot or two open for potential transfers. We we don't know um, how, how how what their needs will be say in eight months from now. We you and I talked about it before we did this podcast. They should be in pretty good shape most position groups going into the twenty one season and even uh, factoring out to uh, the twenty two season. But things happen. Things change, and with the pandemic right now being what it is, we don't know how that's gonna change a lot of rosters we don't know how that's going to change rosters in carolina a roster at carolina or around the country uh and kids that are from north carolina that might be elsewhere or might be committed elsewhere there's a lot of stuff that could still happen so the fifth element of what we're looking at for 2021 is a giant question mark so if we had the four faces of the kids we just talked about the fifth one would be a box with a giant question mark because there's still something unknown out there that may still occur yeah i mean uh they they're leaving they're uh leaving some space open in case you, you like you said we don't know we don't know if uh, somebody will want to transfer or or uh you know as you know uh, a diamond in the rough that unc may find uh in a some camp evaluation you just they're they just don't want to be handcuffed if you know they're they're loaded up and then they find this kid or this kid comes to them and like, Hey coach, I want to play for, for UNC. And then they kind of feel like they're, they're handcuffed. They, they can't do anything. And, and so, um, but we are keeping our eyes and eyes and ears open. And uh, that's all we can do. Like you said earlier, it's kind of hit a, a pause button and it's yeah. just, I mean, we're, I, and, and you know, Carolina fans probably have gotten a little spoiled with all these recruits. And then, you know, with Grimes reclassifying, that kind of they're like, oh well, it was good to get him, but he's already down there in the, the down there practicing with Carolina, and and by all accounts, doing doing really well. Yeah, I, pause button, I think is the way to look at it. But it doesn't mean that we're not continuing to kick over stones and figure out the pulse on some things. And like I said, there's going to be something's going to happen down the road, which a new name or two or more will pop up on the radar. She's Dina King. I'm Andrew Jones. You've been listening to another UNC football recruiting podcast here on TarHillIllustrated.com and Tar Hill Illustrated on YouTube. Don't forget to hit like if you like this video. Hit the notica- notification bell so you get updates every time we upload videos. UNC football recruiting, basketball recruiting. Of course, we're all over the Tar Heels in football and basketball. Thanks for stopping by.